Hello, my name is Eric Stephen, and I am one of the pastors at the Village Church. The following podcast is a ministry of the Village Church. We hope that it inspires you, that it draws you closer to Jesus, and it opens your eyes to the possibilities of living in the kingdom. Enjoy, and God bless. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this community. Thank you for the weather. Thank you. Um, gosh, thank you for the snow. <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, Jesus, as we wrestle with hard things and as we uh, wrestle with what it means to follow you and be your disciple, I ask that you would have grace on us and that you would give us soft hearts and that we would be willing to think through things and really ponder them and not push them aside. Um, Holy Spirit, I ask that uh, you would give us courage today to be men and women of God, that you give us courage to lay bare our hearts and walk into the things that um, you might be asking us to that are, are scary. And I ask that in your holy name. Amen. All right. So let me ask you, I have a couple questions for you, but number one, who gets to tell you who you are? Who gets to tell you who you are? Um, maybe if you're a kid here, you're like, well, mom and dad, they tell me who I am. They tell me where to go, what to do, how high to jump. Um, others of you are like, what do you mean? I get to tell me who I am. For some of you, you're like, well, we're at church, of course. God tells us who we are. And that's the obvious answer. I want you to hold on to this question and think about it because it is one that you wake up every morning wrestling with, even if you don't know it. And that is who gets to tell me who I am? Who tells me who I am? Second question I have for you is, what holds your affections? Or maybe a better way of saying that is, what is the object of your desire? What holds your affections? What are the things that you, that hold you, that you have a passion and intensity about? I would argue to you that the things that hold your affection might clue you into who you are and what tells you who you are and who gets to tell you who you are. So, Question number one, who gets to tell you who you are? Number two, what, is, what holds your affection? And number three, I have a statement for you, and it's a mind-blowing statement. It's a statement you've never thought about. You're going to walk away from the sermon going, wow, Eric is so amazing, and that is you have a body. Right? I don't know if you knew this, but you have a body. Right? So if you, if you walk away from the sermon and you're like, I don't know what that sermon was about, what I'm telling you right now is that at least you have a body. That is what this sermon is about. All right? So let me just rephrase it or put it out there for you. Who gets to tell you who you are? What holds your affection? And you have a body. So why would I be wanting to talk about all this? Well, today we're going to talk about radical gender. And I know as soon as you saw that, or some of you, I mean, we didn't advertise other than on the website, so if you are like the rare villager um, who looks at the website, then you would have known that this is what we were talking about. Otherwise, you would have had no idea. I didn't want to tell you because most of you would have left, right? So I know it's making you a little uncomfortable already because you're like, oh my gosh, where we're going with all of this, uh, this gender word. Well, let me just tell you right now as we're talking about all of this is that I am disappointed with my sermon. You're going to be disappointed with my sermon, and I'm not going to talk about all the things that you think and want me to talk about, right? But when we formed this whole sermon series on radical discipleship, and we anchored it in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, where it says, you know, how the disciples are like, how do we follow you, Jesus? And he's like, all right, well, you're going to have to deny yourself and take up your cross. And we've been kind of looking at different things. And last week, you should have gotten a clue Michael talked about submission, so we're getting a little bit more, you know, we talked about courage, and that's a little bit of an abstract idea, and we talked about waiting, and we've talked about following, and we talked about hospitality, but then all of a sudden, boom, Michael throws down, he says, all right, now all of you need to submit, all right, he, he said it more nicely than that, um, right, but we talked about radical submission versus normal submission, and so you should figure that this is getting a little bit more intense when it comes to being a disciple because if you're going to follow jesus and have everlasting life and and be made alive then everything has to be on the table and that would include your gender now gender is a hard word 
Because if I were to ask all of you, what is your gender or what do you think about gender, you would have like a lot of different answers for it. Some of you might have like some standard answer that you like, repeat over and over again. Others of you are like, oh, I don't know, man, like this is a difficult question. Well, you know, 70 or 80 years ago, this little word was more a linguistic word that categorized words, right? There are male and female words in Spanish, right? It was just, it's categorizing things. Right, so all like if you said, "What's your gender?" Oh, male, female, but but even that is just we're talking about language. We're not talking about sex and biology and that kind of thing, right? But over the last seventy years, it's been a little bit co-opted. So it's an uncomfortable word. So when I got to preparing the sermon, I was like, "Oh man, why did I choose this word? What was I thinking?" All right, I don't know what I was thinking. Um, and then I had to go on a retreat with a bunch of pastors. Oh, it's hard to work on a sermon with a bunch of pastors, and especially when you tell them you're going to be talking about radical gender. Then they're like, well, are you going to do this? Are you going to say that? I'm not going to say any of that. All right, so in talking about gender and answering the question, who gets to tell you who you are? Now you understand why I'm asking these questions. What's the object of your affection? And you have a body. I need to help you understand the waters you've been swimming in. So for some, some of you who just love taking pictures of the slides that I do, this is a good one to take a picture of. Also, Jill Thomas is probably, hi Jill, she's probably watching me or she's coming tonight. She is transcribing it, and so she puts all the slides in the transcription, so you'll be able to get this. But these are the waters you're swimming in, and I'm going to talk to you very quickly about these waters, but if you're really an interested person in all of this, you can go do some research and some Googling. Okay? But even if you don't know it, even if you know nothing about the words I have up there, they are influencing how you answer the question, who gets to tell me who I am? Right? So, first through fourth wave feminism. You know, like, first wave is women getting the vote. Fourth wave is sex-positive, postmodern, Foucault, deconstruction, feminism. Okay? For those of you who know any of what I just said, congratulations. All right? It influences how you think about things. Freud and Marx and Judith Butler in these waves helped form and answer the question, who gets to tell you who you are, right? Who gets to tell you who you are and where the object of your affections are? Now, some of you may have read queer theory or transgender theory or, or even those are things that you wrestle with in your own life, just your external and internal voices are telling you that you are something else than what your your body is telling you and so you know all about that and if you know nothing about it it still is impacting the way you think about yourself and your affections and how you understand who you are and what you're supposed to do with your body right some of you know what masculinism is who robert bly is maybe some of you have watched the a walsh documentary what is a woman Right? You might know this is something that's going on in our culture. But maybe some of you are in the church and you maybe don't know a lot about that, but you've been influenced on answering this question because you've, heard, you've been part of or heard of Promise Keepers. You've read John Eldridge. Or you've heard so many talks on the roles of men and women. Or you don't know it, but you have been heavily influenced by the Council on Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. I'm not making any judgment on any of this though I think some of it is much better than others, it all is telling you how to answer that question. It's all telling you how to answer the question. Who gets to tell you who you are? What is the object of your affections? And most important, what am I supposed to do with this body that I have? Well, I'm going to answer the question really quick for you. And in fact, today I'm going to hopefully go really fast and then give you 20 plus minutes to ask me questions, all right? So here we go. I'm going to answer the question for you with the most radical gender statement in, in my mind in the New Testament, and that comes out of Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 through 28. It says, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children. And this word children, we need to, to stop here a moment because it a better, the NIV is trying to be inclusive here. It's trying to say men and women, but it's very important translated here to say sons because it's not saying anything about gender here. It is saying about position. It is the oldest son. So all people who are in Christ hold the son position of God through faith for all of you who were baptized into Christ have 
clothed yourself with Christ, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, when you read this, I'm sure that you're thinking, oh yeah, the most radical statement on gender must be that there is neither female, male or female. That's it. That's the most radical gender statement here. No, the most radical gender statement in this is the very first part. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God. All of us who are baptized into Christ hold the position of sonship, right? All of us who follow Christ and accept the death and resurrection and ascension of Christ and have committed to the lordship of Jesus, right, hold the place of sonship. And so what we are saying is, and here's the radical part, if we are sons, then the person who gets to tell us who we are is Jesus, right? The person who tells us who we are is Jesus, But it continues to say that we have been clothed in Christ, right? Clothed in Christ. And all these divisions, Jew and Gentile, slave and free, male and female, and we'll talk a little bit about this later, but these divisions, they are all removed by Christ. So the object of your affection now is Jesus. So here's why I think this passage is radical in its gender. Because what it's saying is, the person who gets to tell you who you are is Jesus. The object of your, primary object of your affection is Jesus. And there is only one gender. Can you guess what it is? I'm going to get controversial. There's only one gender, and it's Jesus. Now, I'm not saying that male and female has disappeared here. What is being said by Paul is that your maleness your body, your physicality, everything that makes you male and everything that makes you female is subject to Christ and not primary, right? In understanding who you are, right? In understanding who you are, Christ is primary. When you step into sonship, you step into Christ. When you hold the favored position with God, you step into Christ. This is really, really important because we spend a lot of time in our culture and in our world trying to figure out who we are to be as men and women or how we're even to understand ourselves in this brokenness in between those two things. And this passage says, no, no, no. You don't have to answer that question. What you have to answer is Jesus. Who is Jesus? What is Jesus doing? What does Jesus look like? That's who I am to be, right? It is the primary thing that is put forward, okay? All right. With that all said, I do want to talk about bodies because that's all I really want to talk about today. Um, yes, I could have spent hours and hours talking about gender, and, we, and I will answer every question. I will give my best shot after this message. But today, I think the thing I think all of you need to know about and think about is your body and how God deals with your body and what God thinks about your body, okay? So, but I want you to understand that the answer is that a merciful, loving God is the one who defines you. And when you clothe yourself in him, no matter what struggle you're having in the midst of your gender or trying to figure that out or trying to understand the role you have in the world, Christ is the thing that goes before you not that gender, okay? Now, let's talk about bodies in Genesis chapter 1. And I really wanted to spend hours talking about Genesis 1 and chapter and 2 and, and break it all down to you. And more and more I thought about it, I should just look at one verse. And this is chapter 1 of Genesis, the beginning of the Bible, verse 27. We have This is the sixth day of creation. God's getting more complex, and every day he says this is good, and he gets... To this part, and it says, So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. You might answer the question, Who gets to tell you who you are? is whoever created me. Right? And it's important here because it's not you who created you, it is God who created you. And so he gets to be the person who narrates for you. And Christ is the one who helps you walk through that. But what's beautiful here is that you are created in his own image. And this word image is where we get the word idol. Right? We are 
images of God. So we are put forward as icons of God. But what you'll find out in Genesis chapter 2 is that we are body and spirit. But the way that we represent the image of God is bodily, physically. And he says this is how it works. He created them in his image how? Male and female. All right? So when you're imaging God, your body itself is very, very important. And you as a woman and you as a man image God into the world physically, right? So when I do something in the world, I do it as a man, and that is masculine, and I image God forward. And what's powerful about that is that you experience God from me in a way that none of you can image God because my DNA and my experience reflect God in a unique way, and so does yours. So wherever you go, you're imaging God. Your body, in all its makeup, its flesh, its sexuality, its brain, its everything, is an imaging of God. Body as is, is an, as important as spirit. Okay. The other thing about this is, if you look at Genesis chapter one, and you look at all the myths in Genesis chapter two, you look at all the myths about how people are created. What you will find in all the myths is that the best human beings are slaves to gods. At worst, they're just a byproduct of some violent thing happening with the gods made for slavery. And in there is no myth, and this is what's so powerful about what Moses writes and what the Hebrews then coalesce together, especially when they're in conversation with the Babylonians, but that's a whole other kind of thing, is that female all of a sudden is equal to male in the Jewish narrative. Females never bear the image of the gods, right? But the Jews said, no, 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 it's not just, Moses says, through the inspiration of God, no, it's not just Male, it is male and female that image God together, and without them, there's not a full imaging, right? So there's a dignity that God gives us when he says both male and female image God into the world. All right. So most of you, I hope, but maybe not all of you, know the story of Genesis, and so Adam is put in the garden. Adam and Eve are made. They, they're told not to eat from the tree of the good, the good and the evil. They do. Knowledge of good and evil. They do disobey. And in that disobedience, this is what I want you to catch, is when God comes looking for them in chapter 3 of Genesis, and he's saying, where are you? Adam answers, and he says, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. There's a clue in this of why image bearing is so important or body is important in image bearing, is that when we sin, what is the thing that we are fully aware of? Our bodies. Our bodies are what we're aware of, and we want to hide them, right? And there's consequences, and we're kicked out of the garden, and here's what happens. Your body is exiled. Our bodies go into exile. The image of God, the thing that's supposed to image God, is now running away from God and exiled from God. We are in exile. Now, we'll talk about how that's reversed in a minute. But I want to, as I've been thinking about this idea of bodies and about Jesus, Jesus, if, if Jesus is our primary gender, so to speak, Jesus is where our gender finds its meaning and rests in, right? Then how did Jesus deal with his body? What did he do with his body? So I started thinking about this, and I came up with two moments where I thought were rather awkward bodily moments, at least in my brain. Okay, so I want to read those to you, and then I want to think about how Jesus deals with his body, okay? So Luke 7, verse 36 through 38, um, I'll read it. It's an interesting story. Okay. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in the town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them 
with their hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. Now, you know, if you know the rest of the story, the Pharisee was like, why, he would not be letting this woman do this if he knew who she was. Well, you could add to that, he would not allow her to do this at all, because hair is one of the most sexual things on a woman in the Jewish, in the first century. So I just want to explain how awkward this is just for now. If let's just say you knew that I was going to die in eight months, and I'm standing up here, and you're sad, and I'm talking, and one of the women in our church with long hair gets up and comes over here and starts taking off my shoes and pulling up my you know, pants and crying and wiping my legs down with her hair, none of you would be like, well, that's normal. <laughs> well, that's, that seems normal to me. Now, it's beautiful how Jesus protects this woman, but that's not really what I, I, I want to talk about. I want to talk about just how Jesus handles it. He says nothing about what the woman is doing other than she's honoring him, right? But when you just think it from a bodily perspective, like this is his body in a culture that is much, much more careful about how it, you know, in its modesty, he's standing amongst a bunch of men most likely and a prostitute, because that's what she is, walks in who he's connected to and begins to wipe him down with her hair, her feet, which is gross in general. She's wiping all the mud off of his feet with her hair. And he's just okay with that. He just stands there in it. He's okay with it. And I just like, man, this guy is okay with his body. This is, this is an awkward moment. But I just want to talk. So that's one. We'll, we'll chat about it in a minute. But just keep that one in your head. Let me give you another one that's not as awkward. It's very cultural, but it would be awkward for you and I. So I put it in here because when I read it, I think, huh, this is interesting. So John 13, 22, 24, Jesus has just told his disciples that one of them is going to betray him. And it says his disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he meant. And one of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Now, I love the King James because it says it was, he was laying on his bosom. But honestly, the way it is is that they, it's a short table, small table, and he's laying on his stomach. I mean, they're all eating on their stomach or on their left side. And they're close together. So most likely what happened is, so Simon Peter motioned to the disciple and said, ask him which one he means. And probably what happened is John, this is John the disciple, lays his head on Jesus' stomach and is like, hey, which one of us is going to betray you? Which in that like just that physicalness, right? These are just two moments of physicality. Now, that's normal in first century culture to all recline and hang out as men like that. Not so normal. I'm not putting my head on any of your guys' stomachs while we eat. That's not happening, right? But again, do you, do you just catch what I'm trying to communicate a little bit here is that, that Jesus had a body, and Jesus engaged in really awkward, intimate things with that body, and he was okay with it. He was okay with it. He was okay because whatever he brought forward, he was imaging God. And so as this woman is awkwardly washing his feet, the way he handles her and cares for her and protects her really rests on how comfortable he is with his body and who gets to say who he is and where his affections are and what he's going to do with his body, right? My point simply here. And, and I mean, it's a real simple point, <laughs> is that your body is where God has his image. So when people look at you, right, as woman and as man, they are seeing God's image in all of its kind of grossness. I hung out with like six guys. There was tons of farting, image of God, Right? There's this comfortability with a body. Now, the problem is, is that when the fall came and Adam and Eve sinned, one of the thing, biggest things is that we became very uncomfortable with our body and we began to damage our bodies. And the enemy, do you know, we, we think that the enemy attacks, you know, some kind of our soul. No, yes, but no, he attacks your body. He's going after our bodies. And if you look at the culture that we live in, it is a war on your body, the image of God. 
So, what kind of response might we have? Well, we had a great sermon series on grief and gratitude. And I would argue that your body has a lot of griefs in it. Right? There are a lot of griefs just in a body that's fallen when you get older. Right? And a lot of upsetness about how it doesn't work the way it used to. And yet, no matter what age and no matter what space of brokenness, that body reflects God. And so I think there is a time for some grief about the scars of exile on your body. Some of those scars have to do with what's been done to you that has shaped your affection and shaped how you understand things that have you, things that have been said to you, ways that your culture has told you that you're valuable, right? How you have been told a man is and a woman is, what is feminine and what is masculine, right? All, there's these huge narratives, and this is why I, I want to argue to you that the only narrative, this is why, there's, why I said there's one gender. You want to know how to be a woman? Be Jesus. That's it. You want to know how to be a man? Be Jesus. Because, yes, there's this great, there's even more distinction in male and female in, in, in Jesus, and there's no distinction, right? The only one who gets to define you on how you act and what you're called to do is Jesus. And so there are some griefs. There are griefs for choices that you've made, griefs for things that you struggle with, things that have happened in your past, ways that your body is falling apart. And so I would argue that part of responding to this, to sort of this embodiment, this challenge for you to own your body as an image bearer is to grieve. And grieving requires a certain level of reflection on the things that have gone on in your past and the things that define you and tell you who you are. But also, gratitude. Your body is awesome. And the one that you have in all its brokenness and all of its scars is the one that Jesus is continually redeeming and he wants to project himself through you. He wants you to be his icon in the exact way that you are. And so as a woman, when you step into a room and you say something, it is feminine by the very being that you are a woman, not by any other definition, right? But by the fact that you are a woman and you speak or you are a man and you speak and you speak in Christ, and you put forward the image of God. So, I just would like to close with Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. It says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And I love the King James, so I put it here. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. It's a very, Paul is like, yes, I have died to Christ, there is a future resurrection and a new body, but I live now, and I live by faith, and I move forward in the Son of God who gave me life. So my invitation, really, is, I, again, to go back to my one statement, you have a body, and it's a lot more important than you think it is. It's a lot more important than you think it is. I'm willing to answer, I got at least 15 minutes, maybe 20. I'm willing to answer any question I have not covered that you might have about gender and all those kinds of things, or you just want to talk about what I'm talking about, or you're like, just get Eric to stop talking about this, and we'll move on. But either way, Peter, and then Ellen. Um, so, so you said that the only gender is Jesus, does that mean he's neither? So, and like, what does this mean for, like, not going by she or he, like, if you use the pronoun them, they? Uh-huh. Like, is that a bad thing? Well, let me, let me go backwards for a sec. When I say that there is one gender, it's very obvious that Jesus was a man. My point is very simply is that you being a female or you being a male and what God has created you is subject to Jesus. And the thing that gets to define you, so when we talk about he, she, they, those things don't get to define you. Jesus is the only one that defines you. So when you're struggling with um, internally with like, okay, I've got this body, and internally I don't know if I feel like I fit in it, all those kinds of things, 
the invitation is, okay, yeah, that's difficult, and it's hard for me to figure that out. But my invitation is to be in Jesus, to know that I'm safe there regardless of what kind of wrestling I'm having with the definition that he's given me of who I am. Okay? Does that, does, that make any, does that make any sense? I know that was a little complicated. Yeah, somewhat. So does that mean like it's bad to go by? Well, I, I would say, I'm not going to make a value statement on that. What I would say to you is that you re- before you want to move into something like that, you really, really want to think about what is it that Jesus is inviting me to do because he's given me a physical body. And that body is a body of a, a woman. And so what am I going to do with that? How do I deal with that? I've got to wrestle with that before I rush into making any statements. What's the, what's the most loving way to interact with somebody who is struggling with their sexuality, struggling with their gender, how to label themselves? Is it to agree with them? Is it to say, no, you are a male and I'm only going to call you a male. And if that's not okay with you, it's tough luck. Mm, yeah. Well, I think a lot of that depends. Um, but I'm going to assume that you're talking about adults for a second. And I think Scripture is very clear that the way that we engage with people is through kindness. I, I don't find anywhere in Scripture where it says you bring people to truth by yelling at them and telling them what truth is. It is the kindness of God that has drawn us in. right? So I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that it's case by case when it comes to being kind and using pronouns and things like that, but I think being generous to people and how they see themselves at the same time being honest on how how you see yourself and how you know who you are and how you know who tells you who you are. Like, it's very, very important. When it comes to children, I would be very, very careful in how you're training up your child and helping them understand who they are. So I think kindness is, and I can't give you a formula. There's not a formula. It's the kindness of Jesus and the inviting people to meet Jesus. So I don't know if that really answers your question. But in Yes. Yeah. Let's also, consider. First Peter 3. Oh, Gen- so there's there's the, always, the give, the, always be ready to give an answer for the hope that you have, yes. yeah. but do so with gentleness yeah. and respect. Mm-hmm. There's a there's an invitation to kindness. In yeah, that. yeah, yeah. So, kind of before the sermon even started, uh, I, I was thinking like about the line in the Apostles' Creed, how we believe in the resurrection of the body, mm. and so already we have this creed that we go by and and that maybe we don't fully understand uh, about the body but i'm just wondering the body is more than just gender and sexuality it's like uh the ways we take care of it but also we have an understanding that god's gonna redeem our body and resurrect it in the last days um so i'm just wondering uh like what what you have to say about like taking our care of our bodies health wise and and in terms of what we eat and uh how we point that towards yeah so i don't want to speak against the crepes that we're about to eat (laughs) um but yes i think it's all of that but what I, and I think, you know, Corinthians talks about our body being a temple, right? Um, First Corinthians 6, I think, is where that is. But the idea, so yes, this is God's, this is where God dwells. But I think my, I, my only pushback is, I think, yes, you being male is so unique to reflecting the image of God and so, so important um, for what you bring because Scripture is very clear that God's image is male and female, and what you are as female is so important. 
to, to imaging for what he got is. So I think, yes, taking care of the body is a very important thing. It's part of that. Yeah. Nice and then we'll, I got you, Ellen, after us. So I'm certain right here in this room, we've got a wide diversity of sure. viewpoints um, about what the Bible says about gender and mm -hmm. how we should interact. Mm -hmm. The village has a history of living in peace. Yeah. Can you discuss what are the rules that we play by that make that work so that we can love each other when we disagree? What are the, how, how do we live at peace? How does the village do that? Because there are many of us. Well, I think one, at the village, we anchor ourselves around a creed and covenant members anchor themselves around a doctrine. Um, but that we, are, in the creed, it, it doesn't make a lot of statements about this. So we're anchoring, again, around Jesus because we have a confidence that if we are all pursuing Jesus and moving ourselves towards Jesus, that we're all saying we're willing to be transformed in all of those views. So I think the invitation of the village has always been when it comes to the simplest things, like I think a simple infant baptism versus a believer's baptism, we hold it with an open hand to how we hold our, and understand our gender and what makes us male and female. We're going to hold that with an open hand and say, okay, Jesus, you're the one who gets to tell me who I am. And we're going to do that together. And we're all in different places in that journey as we wrestle with that. So, so I think the open-handed part of that. I'm going to have let Ellen and then I'll swing back over to you. Okay, so I just thought it was really funny because we're just talking about gender today and the Christian living class. We're also been talking about that. Mm. Yeah. That's and we've been talking about like the half male, half female, like the two parts. Yes. And that how they reflect God. I believe the male is danger. Sure. Like, okay. It was... Well, I remember the female was a vulnerableness, uh -huh. beauty, and yeah. mystery. Yes. So I can't remember exactly what the male was, but I know it was danger, something else. Yeah. So that's a lot of what we've been talking about lately. That's cool. And, and I would not disagree with those, but I would also push a little bit and say that those aren't necessarily the thing. You do not have to be female and reflect any of those. It's very, very important. Part of sometimes with the waters we swim in is that there are people who put us in categories and said, if you're not this category, then you're not a woman. Or if you're not this category, like I'm not dangerous and I'm not really strong, then I'm not a man. And so, so we have to be very careful because those categories begin to tell us who we are, but they're not biblical categories per se. Now, I'm not gonna, I, I know John O'Hare well, who teaches the class, and I don't disagree with him, but I just want you to understand that categories you have to be careful. That's not, it's all not all encompassing. Those are just good ways of thinking about it. Yep. Oh, we got two mics, and then we're over here. All, Eric, right, all right, we got mics. Okay, Eric, go I just want to say thank you so, so much for this message, and it is a hard topic and uncomfortable, and so I appreciate all of your hard work and what you did to prepare it. Um, and I really, I really, really like bringing just going back to this every time because I I remember you know friendships with people that I've had where they're struggling with these kinds of things and like you know I I I did always just want to say I love you and you know are you let's pray about this and let you know are you are you praying and are you reading scripture and are you pursuing your relationship with with Jesus and especially if they were followers and, you know, if they're not, I guess going back to Pierre's question, you know, if they're not followers, you know, just be trying to establish relationship where, like Mark said, to give an answer. Yeah. So when they ask, you yeah. know, because the bottom line is Jesus is, is, is what we need to be per helping people see that invitation because Jesus has an invitation for every single person no matter where they are, what they're, what they're dealing with, whether they believe in him, whether they don't believe in him. And so kindness, love, and historically, you know, I, in college I did a whole paper on, on homosexuality and the church. And so I did a ton of research about historically how that was handled and how sad it was and, and how 
you know, horrific, really. And and so my I think the end of my paper was we need to love people like that is what we are called to and pursue them and push them towards Christ and or invite them towards Christ because mm-hmm. you can't make anybody do anything. Yeah. So anyway, thank you very much. And I and I think that it's hugely important topic like for teenagers. And I really appreciated John's what he said. But I also appreciate what you just said about not putting people into categories because there are a lot of people, especially in our in teens, that are struggling with with our the more traditional norms of what makes a man and what makes a woman. And so I really want really thank you for saying that. And yeah, thanks a lot. You're welcome. All right, we got Ron, then we got here, and then we'll swing back. Oh, oh, Ron, I got we're going back and forth. Just say I've got the mic. All right, go for it. Okay. Well. Um, First of all, I was not at all disappointed in your sermon, oh, so good, thank thanks. you. <laughs> uh, um, I just wanted to reflect back something that I that I think I'm hearing and I think I'm understanding, and you can clarify if it's not quite right, but I, I'm getting the feeling that as Jesus is the one who defines our gender and that we have the body that God gave us, that th- our expression, our authentic expression of Jesus through our body is what defines, in my case, maleness or masculinity. And it's not something that comes from what I see on television or advertising or what other people tell me or anything of that nature. So like the way that I express myself when I am authentic about who God created me to be that is what male is as I reflect God in the way that I do, which may not be the same as you or yes. Michael or yes. anybody, any yes. other guy in yes. here. And yes. the, the opposite, of course, is true yes. for, or the, the, the same thing yeah. is true for women. Yeah. So am I getting it? Yes, that was, yeah. If hopefully uh, Jill got that word for word so that I, <laughs> that was really nice. Thank you. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. Okay, so I think on this side. Um, we started hosting discussion groups uh, initially in our church and now in our homes and we never know who's going to show up and Mm. uh, there's a young man that is now one of our main leaders and collaborators in growing the thing and so forth and he identifies as gay Mm -hmm. and he's a very bright young man went through a lot of stuff sure drugs, addiction, suicide, everything. And he's come out the other side. And one of the wisest things I think I've heard him say is that he's reached the conclusion, believe it or not, through the help of Jordan Peterson, who <laughs> claims saves his li- saved his life, is that he's learned that his sexual uh, identity is not his, it, that it isn't his identity. That, mm-hmm. that isn't who he is, and he's and that helped him find peace mm-hmm. in not I, and not being forced into a category by society. Yes, and uh, th- that's it's it was profound in the in the change that it had in his life. Yeah, that's so really cool. When what I've come to the conclusion myself is that society doesn't let us often do is I can, I can be accepting of just about anybody, but that doesn't mean that I approve, right? Right. So I can love someone, respect them, but not necessarily approve, but we're, we're told that we have to approve of everything, mm-hmm. and that if you don't, you're some sort of a hater. Mm-hmm. And, and that simply isn't true based on what's on the Gospels. Right, I would agree. So. Oh, no, that's very beautiful. No, thank you, that, that, was, that was good. Um, are we on get yeah, Darren and then to Rod? Hang on, Rod. We're gonna go Matt and then Rod. Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, I was hoping Rod would go first so I could keep collecting my thoughts. Oh, um, <laughs> we can do that. Sure, sure. Rod, go first. He needs to collect his thoughts. I wanted to collect my thoughts. Um, <clears throat> I really appreciate the aging of our bodies, and when you talked a little bit about, uh, I think when Paul says. Um, Outwardly, I'm wasting away, but inwardly, um, 
boy, I'm at that stage. And it is, it's hard. It's hard to have this body and know that we live in this age of decay and that it's not going to get better. I think in my youth, you always look forward to, I'd be able to do more with mm -hmm. my body. And now I'm doing less and less with my body. But inwardly, I'm being renewed. And I love that idea, too, that Paul says, because um, the the power of Christ in me now comes through a different, I mean, it's still embodied, yeah. Um, but it's embodied in something that's disappearing and in the end um, is regained only in, in what comes next. Yeah. I like that. Now you got your thoughts collected, man. I well, I hope. Um, so I, first off, I'll say I really appreciate the sermon, and I think it's such an important message to say our primary identity is in Christ, and that's we should always be going to that first, and that's how we express our our, our body is an expression of Christ in the world, and um. I guess what I what I just want to say is, and it's been touched on here, is, is there are a lot of different viewpoints, I think, even in this church. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think it's hard for me to go through this conversation without giving full-throated comment to uh, holding in abeyance which side, what view is correct, but sort of acknowledging how much pain has been caused by this conversation mm -hmm. for a lot of people in yep. a lot of different ways. Yep. Um, it, it tears families apart, it tears churches apart, it tears relationships apart. Mm -hmm. And I, I, th I just want to go to the to the grieving aspect of this is that yeah. I, I think we should grieve first in a lot of ways. Yeah, no, when, I agree. When, we, when we're confronted with someone who disagrees with us, no matter where we stand on the issues, I, I think we should grieve first. Yeah. And we should go to God and ask for mercy. Yeah. Um, because it, it is... A, a very tragic thing for a lot of people in, in every respect. Yeah. And so um, I would just ask the whole church, please approach this humbly, approach this with mercy, sure. the mercy of God. And, right. and, and, and I will try to do the same. Yeah. Um, Cause this conversation and not, and, and approaching the secondary things as, as primary and not, Clinging first to Christ above all else hurts people. Yeah, and, and I and I I want to I want to affirm what you're saying, Matt, and I also though want to say that it's so easy, and just and this is not about you. It's just it's so easy for us to like make this conversation kind of shift to, you know, the okay, the gay movement or the transgender movement or the queer movement, like or wherever people are in those identities. And I think, yeah, we got to have that conversation. And what you're saying is prophetic in its nature and, and an invitation for us to grieve first. And I think, yes. But sometimes that noise gets so loud that the reality is that we lose the rest of the conversation, which is that each one of you is either male or female or in the wrestling of that. And that it's like there's just hundreds of messages about who you are and how you know who you are. And so it's, all of us have been wounded and scarred. And I think it's not just about how it breaks our families apart. It's breaking us all apart and how we understand ourselves. So there is like grief is the way we walk into this because we are people of exile who are being redeemed. Um, and I think that's how we have to look at our, our sexuality and our, our gender and our, on our bodies is in a way of grief and then in a way of gratitude. And, and so, yes, I take what you have to say seriously. Um, I don't. I need to probably end now. But I will say, just for those of you who want to know more of my story and more of my conversation about this, you can go on the Healing the City podcast where I talk about my own same-sex stuff and that I wrestled with through high school and my own and kind of my journey through all of that. So you can hear some of that, and I have that in two sermons too that you can wrestle with. So you can know a little bit of my story from that. Um, and I'll have Sue put a link in the email so that you can go back and listen to those if you'd like. All right. I'm going to pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much um, for this community and their graciousness in walking with people and walking with one another and caring for each other. And I just ask for your grace on them as they think through what it means to be your image bearers 
in their bodies with one another um, and how they tend to one another and care for each other and call one another towards you. And I ask that in your holy name, Jesus. Amen.